Welcome to the Scratching Pen Podcast. Hi, I am Beverly Jones Durr, 47 time published author, publisher, and educator. And I am here to help you write your book. All those creative juices that are locked up in you that you're trying to create something tangible, we are here to help you. The show will include lots and lots of tips to help you get started writing, help you through your writing, and to help you publish your book. There will be other authors on the show and other educators who are here just for you. Your questions will be answered And hopefully, you will learn a whole lot and take away so much that I'll be reading your book soon. Sit back, put your seatbelt on, get your notepad ready, and I'll see you on the other side. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Scratching Pen Podcast, where you find out tips and hear from amazing authors about the books they've written, the movies they've written, and the struggles they've also had. Now, do me a favor, before we even get started, I'd like to invite you to like and share and subscribe to this podcast. We're building our base, and your subscriptions will be very helpful to us. Okay, so let's get started. Today, we have an amazing gift, my friend, and probably will be your friend for information in the future. This is Dr. Clara Denise West. She is the author and creator and founder of Coco and Friends. Hey, hey, Denise, what's happening? Uh, Life. (laughs) All day. Tell us a little bit about you. Well, I am, I'm everything that I didn't expect to be. Mm. I write books for my characters that started off as a project of storytelling with my daughter when she was eight and she had attempted suicide due to bullying. Mm. And so the project has grown since then because she's 34 now. But okay. it's been a while. So uh, <laughs> it's gone from just storytelling to books, to animation, to workshops, to um, different presentations for groups across the country. And right now I'm just focusing on the animation. The project first started off for children uh, in early elementary schools for grades of ages six to 10. And then when I piloted my anti-bullying program, Huntsville City School System gave me Johnson High School. Mm. So it jumped to high school quickly. So the program jumped from pre-K to grade 12. And so now, uh, due to the fact that there's so many age groups, I'm going back to just grade ages 6 to 10 and preschool. I've written two books for preschool that I have not published because self-publishing is a challenge when it comes to marketing and distribution. And I don't want to do that no more. Uh, Mm -hmm. Then I have two um, first, well, early reader chapter books. Uh, One of them I printed through Amazon. It's um, the long shots. And the second one is titled, um, undefeated and I, I haven't done anything except for write it because I, I really want a publisher to pick it up. Um, then I have done several animated shorts with the Coco and Friend characters that I've done myself and had animated um, that I have put into a bunch of, a whole lot of <laughs> of film festivals. And surprisingly, we won a lot of film festivals, uh, mm-hmm. including um, a finalist in Atlanta Children's Film Festival, which we won an award for honorable mention. And Thinking Cap Film Festival, we won the Best Children Awards. And Tokyo International Film Festival, we came up an honorable mention. So we've had a lot of success in the, the, the animated shorts. One thing that I would say is, you know, 
everybody wants to be that next it, <laughs> but it's a lot of work between a thought and a piece of paper and actually getting to a film festival. It's a lot of work. Uh, and it's, it's not, if you think it's going to happen immediately, it's not going to happen. Mm -mm. No, it's not. It's definitely not. We publish books for both adults and children. And sometimes having to explain to them what the process is and how long it can take is frustrating for them. And I understand that it is, but it is called publishing. Yes. It's like we call everything life. This is called publishing. It's the way it is. It takes time. Yes. So now you never thought that you'd be doing all of this years ago. I mean, all of this wonderful stuff that you just talked about. Did you see it in the future? Was it something you saw? No. I started off when my before my daughter situation came up with the bullying as a test engineer with the U.S. Army Aviation Missile Command. So this was nothing that I had ever envisioned. It's just that when you have a child who takes, who looks to take pills to go to sleep and mm -hmm. not wake up, and then you go to doctors and they want to give you pills to <laughs> desensitize you at a point, it's like, no, because what is that teaching her? And what is it going to change anything to have a child who's overfilling to have a child who's numb. And so it was a point of where uh, -uh I've got to figure out how to save my baby's life because she's going to bury me. I'm not going to bury her. I know um, that's right. That's just not the natural order of life. And so at that point, it was trying to find out what it was that I could get through because I couldn't get through. She couldn't, she was only eight. She couldn't tell me what she was feeling. And by my thought process, working for the army, we have a five year, 10 year, 20 year plan. And I I'm remember her, <laughs> five <laughs> years from now, these people won't matter. You know, they won't even be important in your life. Mm -hmm. But for an eight year old, five years, what does that mean? Everything she knows mm -hmm. is yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And she didn't see anything changing. And over the course of time, just talking to her, you would ask her, how's everything? I'm fine. Everything is fine, but you don't want to go to school and you don't want to go to, you don't want to wake up. And I, you know, it just got to a point where it was a circle of sending her out. Um, like I would say in, in a battlefield, you have an injured soldier that comes in, you fix them up and you send them back out and they come right back in and you send them, fix them up again and send them back out at a point that gets old. And so yeah. it's a point of, okay, something isn't working here. And I just, one day my, my thought process hit that the things that I had learned in systems engineering, where you have an input, you have the process and you have the output, I input a happy little sweet little girl and I got out a potential suicide victim. What in that process was jacked up that changed my daughter from what she was to possibly being dead. And I looked at all of the variables and the biggest things that were there was the students, the teachers and the administrative process. You can't really deal with the administrative process. So I looked at the students and the teachers and I found out for the most part that the, the kids really did not know what the golden rule was. You know, they memorized it, but they didn't know what it meant in application. And so that's where I started focusing and was trying to help her to understand to treat people right. But it wasn't helping to help her. And the other kids were still abusive. Yeah. And so yeah. that's when I realized that I had to try to address the bigger issue was the fact that all of these kids need to learn the golden rule. And then it boiled down to learning the fact that they were not there was no really focused agenda on social and emotional learning because bullying itself is is a symptom it's not the problem it comes because children don't know how to act interact or react appropriately in group settings and when I found out she didn't like bugs it was like okay we can work with this because now you don't like bugs but you don't really know anything about them 
So mm -hmm. let's do some research. And even if you never like them, you're going to have to respect them because they're here for a purpose and they have a right to be just like any other creature that God created. They have a right to just be. And mm -hmm. during the process, we found out that the bugs that she despised the most, they were the most resilient. You couldn't kill them unless you just totally annihilated them and the eggs that they lay. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. even if you kill them, the legs will, eggs will lay dormant until the environment gets to a point where they can survive in it. Then when they can survive, they take over, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, I wanted her to have that resiliency where she could not only survive in hostile environments, but she could actually thrive in them. And that's when Coco was born. And that was, came really from the scripture to keep pressing towards the mark of higher calling. And we just call it, keep on keeping on. You just got to keep on keeping on, which is what Coco stands for. Keep wow. on keeping on. And uh, the whole message is the spirit of resilience is that you never, ever give up. And you just keep standing. Just be like, I don't know if you remember that little wobble thing where, you know, you keep punching it and it pops back up. I pop remember, up. girl, we telling our <laughs> age. <laughs> so, uh, that's what weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. Mm -hmm. so, that's what I wanted her to have was the ability to take it and not only take it, but to be able to laugh and walk away from it. Because the reality is that that which does not break you makes you strong. Yes, it does. So I just wanted her to be able to realize that everything that she needed, she had already. She just had to tap into it. And part of that was on my part was focusing on her gifts and the things that nobody can take from her and help her develop those gifts to the the potential that was within her. And I think she finally realized it when she was accepted in the New York film of um, the New York School of Film and Television. And they had 180 out of 4,000 uh, applicants that applied the year that she applied. And she was one of the 180. And out of the 180, it was only five African Americans. Mm. And so, um, she was shocked that she actually, we were all shocked that she made it. <laughs> we went there and I have never seen so many beautiful people in one place. Mm -hmm. It was like you walked in there and everybody had perfect teeth and perfect skin and perfect, perfect. <laughs> and then, you know, here's my little child from Alabama coming up to New York with, you know, just looking at everything and taking it in and realizing that these people had, you had people from Rome, you had people from, um, all over the world that were there competing against her and she was actually selected so mm -hmm. she was it was the crowning moment for her and for me because I felt like at that point I had done what I was supposed to do yeah um, yeah I agree because aspiring to be a wonderful parent a wonderful mom and a wonderful example to your daughter has created these wonderful characters. Let me tell you, I'm a grown woman, in case y'all don't know, but I have read the books. I have seen the animation and it's even an interesting to me. My grand twins, they love the animation, the little snippets that you sent me. They love them. And I can't imagine anybody who doesn't get the book that won't love the beautiful graphics. Now, you know, I say beautiful, we talking about cockroaches, but let me tell you something. You get to like who they are and you almost forget that they're cockroaches. They have well, a Mickey Mouse is a rat. Come on. Yeah, yeah he is. <laughs> so I don't want a rat in my house, but we have Mickey Mouse all over the place. We he, do, when he acts right. Yeah. <laughs> so. Girl, so um, what tips would you provide our young readers, the readers who are just starting to get interested in books, becoming book ninjas? What tips or advice would you give them? Authenticity is the mm -hmm. biggest thing, because if if you can connect emotionally with your audience, then you'll have a following. Uh, but it has to be authentic. There the reality is that you reach people at the human level, at the heart level, and that's where you pull them in. 
So your story has to be authentic and it has to be um, a, a universal truth. The universal truth is that we all go through stuff. We all face our insecurities. We all have areas in our lives where we wish that we were, could be as good as, or that we're not good enough. I don't know if anybody else deals with it, but when I'm sitting in a room full of, of, of uh, people who personally know uh, Bloomberg and different people, it's kind of intimidating. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, how am I, how, how did I get here? Seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but then you also have to realize that wherever you are is not so much because of you it's because you were you're supposed to be there you right. have the right to be at the table yes and yes authenticity is is something that everybody picks up because you can pick up on a fake person in a minute and mm -hmm. the moment you pick up on the fakeness you're done I mean I am I'm done with them yeah. um and so authenticity and the ability to um to just be open um because sometimes we can close ourselves off by not realizing that we don't know everything we don't mm -hmm. have all the answers and the only way that you learn is by acknowledging that there's some things you don't know it's you know right. there's always going to be the unknown and then there's always going to remain the unknowable so you just have to be true to yourself uh, and the other thing is that if you want to be a good writer, you have to read, you have to be able to deal with the masters, you know, go and find out what makes uh, certain authors. I mean, as bad as it is to say, when I first fell in love with reading, reading crazy books, I bought every Stephen King book I could get my hand on. <laughs> I could, it was like, once I got them, I couldn't put them down, even though I'm sitting up reading and I'm scared when the light turns out because, you know, don't know whether Cujo going to come through the door or not. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, but I learned from what reading the way he writes and how he pulls his audience in, how to have your arcs and have your connectivity between your chapters and how to stop a chapter and start another chapter and how to keep scenes moving without somebody going back and flipping trying to find out in the book well what happened at this juncture just to have the connectivity and you don't learn that in a classroom you mm -hmm. learn that by sitting down and reading the masters yes 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 You've given us some amazing tips and I'm grateful for the tips you've given because they reinforce the tips I've also given the kids. You know, they have to hear something more than one time and from more than one person before it starts to click that maybe that was really important. I should write that down. Y'all hear me, right? You should write that down. I'm teaching from the podcast. I know y'all listening. They have an assignment that's due in two weeks. And it's a writing assignment. So this podcast is going to help them complete that. So I'm grateful for you being on the show. Well, right now I'm helping my little, she's seven years old. She's my granddaughter. She found out that she had type one diabetes about a month and a half ago. Mm. And it's been a major change for our family. But for her, it's been a lot of bittersweet because she's suddenly realizing that the things that she used to could eat, that if she eats them, she has to balance out the insulin. And, and if she doesn't get enough sugar, she has to go and drink a Sprite. So it's been one lesson of learning after another, after another, but she's writing a book now uh, about, well, the title of the book is The BS Factor. And BS means blood, blood sugar. And so. Oh, how um, cool. That's so cool. But I'm letting her put all of the points together that she wants to. So she writes things in red, blue, and green to let herself know what the real issue is, how to solve it when her blood sugar is low and how to solve it when her blood sugar is high. And then what the things that, that she wants other kids who may be facing 
a, a type one diagnosis to know that it's not as scary as they think it is. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of remembering if the number is too low, you drink a drink. And if it's too high, you get a shot. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. Listening mm -hmm. to her put her little thoughts together for uh, diabetes. It's been really interesting because I didn't realize she knew as much as she knew. And yeah, so it's important to her. Uh, it's, it's, and then the other thing I did not realize is how much influence TikTokers have on, she saw a little girl who she follows on TikTok with, uh, one of those little meter monitors on her arm. And mm -hmm. after she saw her, she was okay with having diabetes because now one of the stars has a little monitor. So you never know how much influence children have on each other mm -hmm. when they see that this is not abnormal when they see something. So the, the thing that we started off with was with her was we have an apple and you start off with the apple and you write a statement about the apple. There's an apple on the table. Then you describe the apple. The apple is red and it has a stem sticking out the top. Okay, let's go into more details about the apple. Then you set the environment up for where the table is, the the, you know, just set it up. And then when you mm -hmm. get through, you've drawn a picture yes. in words. And once you draw that picture in words, you control it. You, mm -hmm. you master it. That apple mm -hmm. can be anything you want it to be at that yes, point. Yes, it can. It can be a dancing apple. Oh, this that apple got up was, you know, so <laughs> I want, I wanted to make sure that she understood that because that's what I had to learn in animation classes is that you start off with just the very, very, very basic. Mm -hmm. And you build on that until you have created your picture. And once you have created your picture, you can put your picture in motion, you know, mm -hmm. because that picture belongs to you and nobody can help you create your world. I mean, I can make my apple die and rise up again if I want to. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> uh, and so that's the beauty of a written word when you put things into motion yes. and that's what I've enjoyed about animation because sometimes when we're writing the things we're cracking up you know just falling all over the floor thinking about how how crazy these kids are I am so sorry about this with um, the things that they say and the things that they do because um, words have power and when you can take a picture, because a picture is a thousand words. And if, if I can move my picture, I have a whole novel in my <laughs> head that I can put into uh, put into words and make an animation from it. So that's that's the beauty of it. But the other thing is that if you want to do animation, I just learned all of this from um, being in meetings with different animation uh, artists in New York is that the biggest animation companies, I am so sorry for spreading this, but it's the truth. Uh, Sesame Street, Disney, Toon Network, all of them, they, will, they have these workshops, these things that they offer you for free. And there's a gimmick to it because whatever you produce while the, you work in there, they have a little form that you fill out that says that it belongs to them. And even mm -hmm. if you don't want to give it to them and they create something very, very similar, almost identical to what you did, then there's nothing you can do about it because you've signed this non, uh, you, you can't compete with them. So they will hire you for a year and maybe pay you a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year for the working with them, but everything you produce while you're working for them belongs to them. So all of your ideas, all of your creativity that they're going to make money off of is gone. You don't get anything. So if you really want to work with them, write your book, put all your characters in them, describe your characters. If you can't get them illustrated, because once you put it in copyright print, they can't, they can't touch your characters without negotiating. All right. So, good advice, y'all. So, that was good advice. Tell us the name of your book and where the children can get it. Okay. The book that I have out right now is called Coco and Friends, uh, The Long Shots. It's on Amazon.com. Okay. 
And to be honest, I did not write this book to to ever do anything other than marketing. But once it was out, my uh, one of my mentors suggested that I enter into some contests because he really, really liked it. And I did win the Mom's Choice Gold Award, which was a surprise because mm. that's one of the hardest awards to get. Um, and I got the gold. So I was like, wow, that's, that was a shocker because I, I just wasn't expecting it. Yeah. I, I was just hoping to get a silver or just for them to acknowledge that I submitted. <laughs> uh, and so to get the goal award and to be on the page with, with the, um, the Sesame street scholastic and, uh, highlights, that's something I never would have anticipated. Yeah. with something that started out with my daughter attempting suicide. Well, um, I am really proud of you and all your success. I know how hard you worked in the background to make all of this happen. And you are an example of what happens when you put your mind to something, when you believe in what you're doing and you work hard to succeed. Dr. Claire, I am so happy that you joined us today on our podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, little people, I told you that this was going to be an amazing podcast. And I was right. I hope you got a lot out of it, especially those who have assignments due to me in two weeks. In two weeks, I'm just reminding you with every podcast, just in case. And I tell you what, like share, and subscribe. Do that before you leave this podcast today so that you'll know when we're having our next one. And I guarantee you, it's going to be exciting. So from the scratching pen, until next time. Bye. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Scratching Pen Podcast. Were you motivated? Did you pick up a few tips? I certainly hope so. Subscribe to the Scratching Pen Podcast so that you'll be notified the next time we launch an episode. And wherever it is that you're able to see the Scratching Pen Podcast, leave us a message. Tell us how we're doing. And share, share, share with your friends. Stay tuned for more exciting episodes and amazing guests. Until next time.